Hello, everybody. This is Debbie Powell, the Master Gardener for both Calaveras and Tuolumne Counties. And we have our Tuolumne Master Gardener, Al Dahlstrand, that is going to give a presentation called Private Well Management. So take it away, Al. Okay. Um, um, amongst uh, a number of other PowerPoint presentations I put together on, on water conservation issues. I put this private well management one together about three or four years ago, and it basically um, kind of popped out of uh, hearing some experience of people up in the foothills talking about being on wells and how their wells acted and the type of water they got and what their experiences were. Um, what really triggered me to put this together was a comment by a lady who said that she was on a well and they have a had a decent sized lawn but it was in the middle of the summer and after they watered their lawn they typically couldn't do anything else in the house with water like take a shower or do the dishes because there wasn't really enough flow coming out of the faucet to do something do anything with it and I thought, well, you know, hopefully that would be a wake up call to us to say, well, maybe there's something wrong with our well. But um, she didn't seem to know anything, any of the particulars about her well or anything else. So I figured, well, for everybody, including her and all the rest of us, I thought maybe what we need is a, a very short primer on what private well management is all about and how wells react. And, uh, they react quite differently between the foothill areas and the valley areas. So this is a photograph of my own wellhead. This is the main pipe that comes out and the water line that comes out and then goes down into the ground and up to our, our storage tank and up to the pressure tank and up to the house and to the garden areas. Um, there's a little screw and a little hole way in the background here, which you can just unscrew with your hand. And when we talk uh, in a few minutes about monitoring wells, this is where you drop the probe down inside the, inside the casing and drop it down to check where your water level is. So it's pretty basic. These are electrical boxes, both of them. And uh, next slide, Debbie. Now this is a cross section, like a slice you take down vertically through the ground, showing the surface of the ground up in this area, and then down through all of the gravels and sands and clays, showing the location of a couple of, of examples of wells. And uh, this shows wet wells in a typical sedimentary aquifer, as is found in the Central Valley. And the sedimentary aquifer is basically an area like the, like the areas in the Central Valley that are composed of um, gravels, coarse and fine sands, clays and silts, various size material that have been eroded out of the Sierra or out of the coast range over many, many millions of years. And this particular cross section I cut out of the Modesto B and they did a really nice job identifying what's happening with some of the wells in the valley. And uh, there have been a lot of well failures over the last 20 years, both in the valley and up in the foothills. So um, this is the, this presentation is to uh, provide what kind of information we're looking for and basically how these different uh, water sources react. This particular cross section shows some coarse little circles uh, through scattered throughout the, the cross section. These represent gravels that have a lot of pore space between them where water can freely flow. Uh, the, the sections with all the little single dots in them, that represents sands. Uh, some of the sands might be coarse, some of the sands might be fine, but the permeability of these sands is a lot less than the gravels, but still fairly permeable. The uh, dark areas that are kind of uh, hatched with lines, those represent silts and clays, which are very, very fine material that generally speaking are um, not 
uh, not really um, conducive to water going through them. The water usually hits these silts and clays and then flows in the coarser sediments around them to, to get down deeper in the aquifer. Now this particular, um, this particular cross section as an example shows two wells. Uh, it shows what they label as a dry well here and a deep well. And you can see that by the arrows showing the, the rate of flow and the, the direction of flow of surface waters that across the valley coming from rivers and also rainfall, surface waters that percolate down through all of these gravels and sands. And as a deep well, for example, on the left side, pumps and sometimes can pump fairly heavily to, to uh, water large tracts of, of irrigated products. Uh, this well will tend to draw water towards it. And as it draws water towards it, it may pull down the water level. And here's a dashed line going across, giving an example of this might be the current water taper, which is basically dry up above and wet down below between all of these sediments. In a case like this, uh, the, the well on the left-hand side might have pumped for a, a very long period of time and very heavily pulling the water table down below where this dry well is. And now that well is no longer in water containing sediments. And this has happened a lot in not only the Central Valley, but other alluvial valleys around the state of California and in the different states in the West as well. So in this case, the owner of this well um, either has to forget irrigating his crops or his yard, or he has to get a drill, driller out and drill a deeper well to try and get down into areas where, where water can easily be obtained. Um, this has happened a lot in the Central Valley over the last 15, 20 years. In fact, in some places of the Central Valley, south of Merced, down towards El Nido, to the south and over to the west, going over towards the California aqueduct. Um, there has been so much water pulled out of these sediments by deeper high pumping wells that the actual ground surface that we're showing here has actually subsided anywhere from 10 to 15 feet regional. And it's hard to tell in those areas that it's settled, but it's such a broad area that's settled slowly and over time that the average one of us wouldn't, uh, wouldn't ever know it. But they know this because these wells, uh, the shallower wells have gone dry and they've seen survey data showing that a lot of these areas are gradually settling over the last 30 to 40 years. They've also seen cracks in some of the canals. They've seen cracks in some of the foundations of some of the bridges across the irrigation ditches. So they know that the ground is settling. When this happens, all of these, this uh, material up above the water table that's now had the moisture pulled out of it will tend to compact. All of these gravels, sands, and clays will tend to com compact and compress since that water is not taking up the pore spaces between the, all of these grains of material anymore. And this compaction um, is, is really not a good thing because even if we have lots of water coming across this surface again, it won't infiltrate these sediments again because they're compacted together. What kind of a squash is that? What are that? Do you have a question? But anyway, with this, uh, with this compaction, you lose porosity, you lose water holding capacity in these areas. And some porosity will remain probably because these, these particles will hold each other apart just a little bit. But now that they're compressed more, they've lost a lot of water holding capacity that will never be, never be returned to this area. So unfortunately, um, California needs and is putting together in, as we speak and has been the last several years, um, new pr proposed well regulations to to regulate the installation and also the operation of these wells and how much each of these areas can pump. And uh, California is one of the few states in the West that doesn't have groundwater 
bumpage regulations, which is really surprising, but it's coming and it's ne really needed, needed badly. So uh, God help the poor farmer that's uh, fourth generation owner of a short, shallow well in an area who now has a neighbor that is pumping like crazy on a very deep well with lots of new orchards to irrigate. And uh, this God, poor guy with the, the older, shallower well is going to spend a lot of money in the future to, to drill his well deeper so he can get back into operation again. Let's go to the next slide, Debbie. When we consider the, the uh, private wells in the foothills, it's a very different uh, situation. We don't have in the foothills all this massive area of sediments that have been washed out of the Sierra. Uh, what we have is faults, which are shown by the, the steep dipping lines on this example, both vertical and very steeply dipping lines. And then the cross hatching in the lower part shows fracture systems that also occur around these faults. So when there's ground movement, over millions of millions of years, these faults develop and they, they, they chew up the ground and break it up into sometimes very large chunks, but then in some areas there, there's a lot of movement, it's also highly fractured. The areas where these fault systems <clears throat> and also contain a lot of fractures, those are the ideal places for um, potential groundwater in the foothill area. And uh, this example shows some examples of wells, of four different wells I've got on this example, going into different fracture systems. Now, also I showed on the, on the cross section, um, this represents on the right side a steep valley that might, be, might have been formed by faults. And the reason that steep valley is there is that over millions of years, um, this has been faulted and highly fractured in this area. So as large water flows come down this river area, it, it's easy to erode the, the rock that's there, easy to break it up further and erode it. Therefore, these steep canyons develop by high erosion areas. Um, in areas that aren't as highly faulted, um, there will be very little uh, very little variation in probably the surface contour, but in the steeper valleys and uh, in some areas uh, other than steeper valleys and with rock type changes, we'll see large fault systems as well. A lot of these fault and fracture systems will hold different amounts of water. Uh, in some cases, the rock might be very tight together and small fractures uh, fairly tight between the sides of the fractures not giving a large water holding capacity. In other areas, there will be very large faults and wide open fracture systems that can hold uh, much more water. Um, an example of a tight fracture system is in my own, own neighborhood where our, our uh, well uh, and a neighbor's well happen to be in the same rock type, it's called a limestone. And I know this because I know a lot of the neighboring wells around us are not only uh, uh, in deeper than ours, but it's also in a different rock type and it's basically slate in this area. And the chemistry changes too. So a lot of that uh, chemistry change will, will give it a little information about the well. So the, the, the well on our property and the well on the property next door are both in the limestone and everybody else around us has much deeper wells and in a different rock type. So they're in a different fracture system. And I know from pumping that's been done over the last 20 or 30 years, when our neighbor during the drought of the early 90s was pumping his well like crazy to keep his lawn and trees in, in uh, good shape, and we could hear his sprinklers going on a daily basis, I was measuring my well and I could see my well drop much faster than if only we were using it ourselves. I meant the next door neighbor well that was maybe 300 feet away was also pulling water out of the same tracks that our well was, was pulling water out of. Uh, another example of a 
highly producing faults and fractures is the is the uh, valley and the gully along South Washington Street crossing the at the bypass at the main stoplight there, heading south towards Mountain Springs Golf Course. Um, that valley where it crosses the bypass and it is uh, just south of the bypass is an old limestone mine that was a very good producer, but it was also full of water. It had a lot of water in it. The faults were very highly faulted and highly fractured area. And uh, that particular area produces a lot of water from what I'm told over the years. And it seems to continue doing that as well. So there's an example of, of uh, fault and fracture system water that is a large, large capacity. Now, in, in, in an example here, uh, let's go to the well on the right. Um, as I show on this cross section, I show a pre drought water level of maybe five or six years after the, uh, after the drought starts. Uh, there's much less water coming off the mountains and off the foothills, is runoff, much less in the river valleys. And so, not only the pumping of this well, but also the drought and less recharge into these fracture systems uh, shows a current water level way down, uh, much lower. If the drought persists and the, the owner of this well, for example, keeps pumping at a high rate, he may, may get to the point where he gets to the bottom of his well and there are no further fracture systems or his well doesn't go any deeper. The only choice he's got at that point in time is to get in here get a driller in and drill as well deeper and hopefully hit some deeper fracture systems if they're there. Um, let's go over to the left side of the cross section. Uh, each of these wells crosses through a theoretical fault system shown by the steeply dipping lines. And I've drawn in an example of a pre-drought water level and I've drawn in an example down below of a current water level, say after five or six years of drought and continual pumping from each well. The well on the right, you see, is uh, still in a fracture system at the bottom where the pump is likely, but the water level has dropped so much, probably due to the drought and also to the pumping of this much deeper neighbor's well, that the current water level is down below where his pump in the bottom of his well are. So he just, this, the owner of this well just ran out of water. And he too has the option of drilling a new well in a new place on his, on his ground or re-entering this existing well and drilling it deeper, trying to get into deeper fracture systems. Meanwhile, the, the well on the left is with the current water level shown on the cross section, he still has a lot, this well still has a lot of fracture systems left in the bottom third of the well. So he's probably in good shape. And uh, when he gets to the, to the bottom of his well, he's, not all, he, he's uh, in good shape going through these fractures, but also if there's a major fault as shown on the bottom, going slightly dipping to the left, he may pull a lot of water out of this, this fault system too from very far away. So you can see from these two cross sections that the, uh, the occurrence of water in the valley that's distributed more evenly throughout the sediments, the sands, the, the gravels, and uh, the finer silts um, is totally different than what we see in the foothills. Uh, most of the silts and most of the gravels and the sands uh, get washed out of the foothills and down to the valley where they accumulate because they can't go any farther. And then they've got the, those sediments have water holding capacity. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, those are two examples of how dramatically different the occurrence of groundwater is in the valley versus the foothill area. Let's look at the next slide, David. Oops. Uh-oh, hold on. Um, it's, let me see if I can get it to move. Oh boy. Let's see. Um, let me, okay, there we go. Okay, there you go. Okay, this slide, we're just going to talk for a minute about things that you need to know about your well. Um, when we bought our house, uh, part of the papers, uh, 
some of the papers that, that we got through the uh, through the title company included um, included a, a a log of the well itself uh, by the by the well driller. Oops, we, we oh let me go back. back. We okay. Slides. There we go. So what we want to what you can pick off that well log after you've obtained a well log, and if you if you know who drilled the well, uh, you could also go to that driller and tell him approximately how old is your well and where it is, and he probably in his file someplace will have a copy of that well log. And that well log will tell you not only the rock types that he drilled through, but it'll tell you the water producing zones he drilled through, and probably it'll tell you what the final um, test showed as far as gallons per minute that you can pump out of that well. So it's good to have a copy of that well log. That well log will also tell you the total depth, which is helpful to know. And it'll tell you the depth of the pump, where the pump was first installed. And it will also tell you the age of the pump. Um, however, some of the older ones, typically the well drillers tell me that um, on the average pump from residential wells, they typically last 18 to 20 years. If you get 25 or more years out of it, you're really lucky. So if your well is an old one, it, the pump has probably been replaced at some point in time. But if you can find out who replaced it, they can give you some of the same information. And it's also good to know what the periodic seasonal depth is to water from the top of the casing uh, down to the water level. And it's, it's, well, it's good to know this both before and after pumping. But uh, this requires the measurement of water levels. And in the earlier years when we lived on our property here, that was easy for me to do because I worked at the mine and we had a well sounder, which is a, a reel of wire with a probe on it and a little buzzer inside of it that will sound when you hit water after you, after you let this probe fall down your well on the end of this cable. Let's go to the next slide, David. So since I didn't have the luxury of a nice fancy sounder anymore, I went online and uh, and I Googled well sounders, and up came a couple of um, Canadian websites that showed you exactly how to make your own well well sounder, and uh, whether or not it's going to be easy or a little more difficult kind of depends on the depth of your well. Um, the depth of our well and our neighbor's well is only about 150 feet. So when I made this well sounder, I took an old spool that I had off my, off my wire feed welder and I um, took some cord, 150 feet of cord, which this cord is normally used for connecting your hi-fi to speakers around the house. And the directions for this well sounder shows you how to run the wires down this steel tube. And in the end of the steel tube, the two wires are bare on the ends and they, they, they are a little bit about a half an inch apart in this steel tube. So they're not in contact with one another. Now, when uh, the other end of the wire is coming out of the out of the center of the reel comes into this wooden box and is hooked up to a little buzzer. And it's also hooked up to two nine volt batteries which are connected in series. And so the batteries put a charge through the wire and when you put the probe down your well and the probe hits the water surface, the water is the conductor between these two wires in the end of the probe and that completes the, the circuit and that sounds the buzzer. So when you hit the buzzer, then you know, okay, right at that point is where my water surface is. And then what I've done is in five foot increments on the, on the uh, wire itself, I've marked every five feet. So I can know between each five foot mark exactly where I am as far as water level. And what that tells me is if my water level is say in the fourth year of a drought, and I measure my well in the springtime, 
and from the level of the water that, that I get from measuring it is 60 or 80 feet above my pump area, I know, well, I've, I've got a fair amount of water. I can, if I manage the water use correctly, um, I can probably survive through the, the heat of the summer and into the next wet season. However, if your water level is only 20 feet above the pump, and maybe your well has only rated for 10 or 15 gallons a minute, um, that's a pretty good indication that, boy, I've got I've to really watch how I manage my water so I don't pull that water level down to the pump itself and, and have the well fail. Now, over the last 20, 15 or 20 years, there have been so many well failures uh, in the foothill area, foothill counties. And a lot of these failures has been from drought, and a lot of it has been from just pure over pumping and the wasteful waste of water. And, uh, and some of it's just a combination. And some of it's just bad luck because your, your well happens to be in a very uh, small fracture system. And maybe the fractures uh, don't hold very much water because they're very tight together. So it's... Um, Typically, when they when they uh, install a well and they tell you that the well is a 20 or 30 gallon minute producer, uh, you can be fairly confident that that fracture system is probably better than average in size. And if you manage it correctly, you're not going to have any problem usually. But if it's a two to three gallon a minute producer. Um, what you're gonna probably have to do is you're probably gonna to have to have a surge tank at your house and a pressure pump at that surge tank so that your well can slowly, slowly fill that surge tank. And then when you need water in the house, it's pumped in with, a, with an auxiliary pump. But uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a, a well sounder. I just made a PVC frame for it so it's easy to carry. And I probably measure our well's depth probably anywhere from two to three times a year. And so far, even through the even through the last uh, five or six years of drought that we had, ending several years ago, fortunately our well uh, is doing pretty well. But we watch our use. The use of our well is for irrigation only. And uh, we've also, in recent years, gone through two different years of of uh, lawn replacement and uh, you'll see in the literature and you've probably heard in other, in other uh, presentations including the one that I just recorded with Debbie the other day about lawn replacement uh, being a, a big factor in really saving lots and lots of water and what we found that since we use our, our uh, well only for irrigation we found that with the first uh, section of lawn that we took out and replaced, about 900 square feet, that on a weekly basis, we saved about 1,200 gallons of water use. And that all came from our well. So our lawn replacement and replacing it with drought tolerant plants or natives um, was such a success that first year, we actually went into a second, probably a year and a half, uh, second phase of lawn replacement, and that's really saved us a lot of water on well use. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Al, yeah. can I ask a question? Sure. Um, my husband would love to have a lawn, and I have assured him that um, doing some other kind of ground cover shrub to produce green is the way we're gonna go. What what was that? I, I just wanted to know that stat again that you said about how much of the lawn you replaced and it was 1,200 gallons a week. I think that could um, make an impression. Sure, <laughs> and it's 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 amazing too. And it's uh, and uh, what did had, you replace it with? We had uh, nine we had 900 square feet of lawn we took out, and we had 11. We had a PVC system in to uh, four inch pop up. Uh, uh, sprinkler systems and so we had 11 of them and what we did is we kept the PVC in the ground but we converted the PVC system to just a vertical riser 
with a multiple drip head on top of it, which had eight different connections for eight different for a quarter inch tube to go to eight different plants. So when we took out that 900 square feet of lawn, we were using through the sprinklers uh, and watering three days a week, we were using about 1,450 gallons a week. And when we took out that lawn and put these multiple drip heads on the top of 10 out of the 11 uh, sprinkler heads, to 80 plants, we had just over 80 plants, or right at 80. So I figured the average usage of a drip irrigator to each plant, some were half gallon per hour, some were one gallon per hour, a couple of them were quarter gallon per hour. But when I averaged it all out, we had 80 plants and our weekly usage, watering three times a week was 250 gallons. So we saved roughly 1,200 gallons per week. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and, uh, um, and that was evident. That was very clear right from the beginning. And what I did is I took the specifications on the sprinkler heads and I calculated what the water use was with the pressure we had. And so I feel that all the calculations were, were uh, pretty darn close. And so it was substantial. So that's about an 84, 85% water savings, which is amazing, especially if you're, especially if you're dealing with, with a well that has a small fracture system and under drought conditions can be highly variable as far as what it's able to produce over time. And then- Or that, the, the water from TUD. Pardon me? <laughs> I Say said, again? or if you- have to pay for the water from TUD if you do not have true. a well. True. So true. thank that's you for the numbers. My husband's yeah. an engineer, so. <laughs> that's significant, yeah. Now we didn't, uh, we were pretty solid on those numbers and pretty confident in them. So when we went to our next stage of lawn replacement, that too, we took out there 1,100 square feet. Um, and I didn't add up all of the all of the before and after use on those because I was so confident in the fingers in the figures from from our first uh, lawn replacement and uh, but we have definitely saved a lot of water and I notice now measuring our well two or three times a year even with the, the, the you know the dry five or six years we had before these last couple of wet ones um, we our well's been in amazingly good shape and we water basically all our drip systems probably three times a week. And of course, in, in our drip systems, we use different size drippers to different plants depending on their water needs and depending on their size. So, uh, but it's, it's been a, a very dramatic saving. Um, okay, now let's talk for a minute about indicators of potential well problems. If you see a drastic drop in static water level with time, for example, if I measure my well this month and I have, let's say my pump is at 140 feet and my static water level is 80 feet. So I figure, okay, I've got 60 feet above my well, but let's say the rest of this summer, we don't get a drop of rain and it's really hot and we didn't get a lot of rain this year anyway. We're only up in Jamestown area where I live. We're currently only up around 20 inches anyway. So we're well below probably only two thirds of what the 100 year average may be. But let's say in uh, September, um, I measure my well again and I'm at 130 feet. So I've dropped 50 feet and I'm only 10 feet above my pump. That's telling me that, oh boy, I better really cut back on the rest of my watering. And um, I'm getting to the point where I'm only 10 feet above my pipe pump. I better really be careful about the water I use for irrigation. And even though I've got my house on, on TUD water, but most people that might not be the, the case. A lot of people with wells don't have the luxury of also having part of their systems on public water. 
um, if you see a severe loss of pressure and flow rate during or following prolonged use, you know there's a problem. The, the example I gave you early on of the lady, the lady uh, complaining about watering the lawn and then not being able to use water any place else in the house for several hours, that's what this refers to and that tells you, hey, if I watered my lawn, maybe I better let that water, that, that lawn dry up and come back next winter, or maybe I ought to go into a, into a, a process like we went through uh, lawn replacement with uh, plants that use far less water. Um, there's another on the third bullet. Um, if you see fine sediment suddenly, suddenly appearing in the water, that can, uh, that can tell you a couple of things. That can tell you that maybe I'm using too much water and in pumping a lot of water in short periods of time and maybe there's some sediment around the well casing that's coming through the slot, slots in the well casing. Or it can tell you that you're getting very close to the bottom of the well where the pump is installed and when that pump is pumping the last little bit out of the, out of the well it can pull in fine sediments from just outside the well casing. And that actually happened with our neighbor when he was pumping a lot of water in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s, and he started seeing cloudy material in his water too. So uh, once he cut back on his lawn watering, um, then the water started glaring up. On the fourth bullet, if the static water level remains well above the pump and the pumping rate and crusher drop off, um, that may be an indication that you might be pulling some sand in and plugging your well screen or slotted casing. Um, you still have plenty of water in the well, but um, but you're still <coughs> excuse me. You still can't get the pumping rate or the pressure. <coughs> in that kind of a case, you better call a well contractor and have him come out and look at it. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, Debbie, I think that might be our last slide. Let's check for one more. Okay. Yep, that was it. <laughs> that was, that was it. it. Okay. So I guess the. I've, the I've got a question is, for you, Al. Yeah, go for it. The question is <laughs> our last drought was 2014. Uh, and okay. since then, we've you know, had rain. Have, <coughs> is there a way to know if we've fully recovered from that last drought? Because that's when in Tuolumne County, there was over 250 wells went dry. Right. And in some cases, in some cases, those wells may recover and in some cases they may not. Uh, if they're on big fracture systems, they'll probably recover or at least somewhat recover after a couple of wet years. If you're on a very small and tight fracture system, it might take longer to recover. <coughs> now, uh, the other thing to indicate recovery from droughts too is not only the health of your well, but also trees. I, we've got a lot of live oak trees and some blue oaks on our property. And We've noticed over the last, oh, probably five to six years, we've had a lot of death of oaks. And live oaks are usually really tough. They can go through a lot of high variation of, of water. But um, we've noticed a lot of oaks buying, dying over the years. So um, we've and uh, it's been great for producing firewood on our property <laughs> and, uh, and it also produces a hell of a lot of work but we've had a lot of loss of, of oaks and I think it's just because the uh, drought years have dried out probably the top five or six feet of soil, the rocky soil in our case, that it just takes a long time and a lot of wet years to really replenish that to the depth that some of those root systems go. So even though our well may have recovered better than it has in the past, um, 
and in, be in good shape for pumping during these wet years and probably right now too, it's in pretty good shape. But uh, those five or six drought years we had, you know, pulled the water, uh, the water in the pore space and the soil down so much that those oaks put, couldn't pull out the water that they needed, so they died. So that's another indicator. And so uh, recovery from recovery from droughts means different things depending on which factor we're looking at. In the case of wells, if you've got a good well to begin with, you might recover much faster and uh, be in good shape again. But in our case, when we see trees dying, that tells me that the, uh, the vegetation takes longer to catch up with it. So it's affected for a much longer period of time. Any other questions? <clears throat> I'm gonna just bring up one other thing that I've heard you say in, in past years, if you um, bought a piece of property and you were going to build a house and put in a well and all that kind of stuff, and you're looking at the property itself, where would be the best place to put a well? Ah, good, good point, good question, because <clears throat> it just so happens that uh, eight or 10 years ago in our neighborhood, there was a contractor that put in um, three houses. Uh, two of them were on top hills, and one was down in a little bit lower and more rolling area. Um, and the one in the rolling area was closer to public water. So that, that homeowner probably tied into public water. Um, the two houses that were up on top of the hills, uh, during construction, the contractor brought in a well driller and they drilled a well right next to the house. And they're on top of the hills looking down into the town of Jamestown. And both of these homes had to, had to drill their wells probably over 600 feet deep. And the pumping rate was between one and three gallons per minute, depending on the house, which required that each house had to have an exterior storage tank of probably 1,500 to 2,000 gallons and it had to have a pressure pump on it. So as the well was pumping at uh, say two gallons per minute, it took a long time to fill that tank. And then it shut off when the tank was full. <clears throat> and then when a certain percentage, probably 50 per or 60% of that tank is used in the house, the, it's probably got an automatic switch on it to start pumping and filling the tank again. <clears throat> so um, that tells me that and looking at the lay of the land of these two lots, that tells me that these contractors didn't even think about the well. What they should have done is both of these lots that were on that had the deep wells built from the top of the hill, they were both, um, one was about a five and a half or six acre lot, and the other one was a 10 acre lot. And both lots had access to the, on the bottom of the hill on their property, they could have uh, negotiated with a neighbor uh, access into a gully on the bottom of the hill and both had big gullies and uh, if they'd gone into the gully with a drill rig they probably would have drilled a 50-foot hole and hit water and they probably would have hit good water and the reason is that then when these areas are faulted and fractured the reason that gully is there is because it's highly faulted and highly fractured, so the rock's really broken up a lot. And because it's broken up a lot, the surface water will go into those fractures and that's where it will reside. And on the top of the hill, the top of the hill doesn't, doesn't erode much. It takes a long time to erode. That's an indication that it's very, very little fracturing on top of the hill. So with very little fracturing, you're not gonna have you're not going to hit any water until you get really deep and then the fracturing you hit you might be very lucky to even hit it a lot of times people drilling wells in wrong places hit a dry hole and they've got to go someplace else for a while but typically if a property owner can site their well in a depression on the property or in a gully on the property 
um, you've got a much higher uh, much higher chance of hitting fracture systems that might be good producers. So that's a I'm glad you asked that question, Davey. That's a, an important point. Contractors don't care. All they're going to do is sell the house, and then you got to maintain a deep well from from now on. Um, however, if they'd spent um, if they'd spent an extra three thousand dollars on a little dozer work at the bottom of the property to get a dozer road in to back a drill rig in, um, they may have saved eight or ten thousand dollars on drilling costs all for you know three hundred or four hundred extra feet of well. Any other questions? If you have iron issues or other um, contaminant issues in your well, how do you best address that or where do you start? Well, we have, for example, in, in our, our well here, we have, uh, it's in limestone, so we have a calcium issue. And that calcium issue um, tends to, because the well water is high in calcium, it that, that calcium will deposit out in like um, uh, sink screens uh, on your on your uh, your actual um, when you turn the water on the faucet screen itself well, most faucets have a little screen in it and we found when we moved here <coughs> our screens had to be cleaned out probably once a month we had to soak them in muriatic acid to dissolve the calcium now in iron um, we rented a house down west of Jamestown when we first moved here, and that well had high iron problem. And you could see the, the iron, it was an older house, but you could see the iron stains and the toilets and the sinks and the bathtubs. Um, you had to clean, clean, clean all the time if you wanted to get those stains out. So it's a, if you don't clean right off the bat, then you're, um, all of your sinks and tubs and everything are permanently stained and they probably, probably hard to get that stuff out. But uh, a lot of uh, <coughs> a lot of issues like minerals, um, sometimes you can run the water through a water softener to get some of the minerals out. And depending on the water softener and the types of pellets that are used, um, some use salt, some you use probably other pellets. Um, the best thing to do if you know you're gonna have well water with high iron, explore the possibility of, of softening your water. And if you know you have high calcium like we do in our house, um, that can also be taken out with water softeners also. But that's just another thing that you have to maintain. <coughs> Any more questions? Well, Ed, the good news is if anybody does have a question is, Al, you're available to answer questions. Sure. We, sure. we can email you. Sure. sure. And we can find it through mm -hmm. um, uh, VMS. So mm -hmm. Al's on VMS. And uh, Al, I really want to thank you for this presentation. It's, um, it's really wonderful and, and extremely valuable. So you're thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Look forward to meeting you all in the coming months once we're once we're out of this uh, coronavirus area, but it may take a while, but hopefully we'll all stay safe and healthy. Yes. Thanks so much, Joe. Okay. Appreciate You're it. welcome. Okay. <laughs>